All right, so this week we are going to talk about some really good poetry. Um, we're going to do both Dryden and then skip ahead a few years and do some Alexander Pope. So um, they're not really, they're not at all contemporaries of each other. Uh, the poem that we're going to talk about with for Dryden is called McFleckno. Um, it's not super similar in tone to Absalom and Achitophel, which we did last week, but you might see some similarities. But it wasn't written until the early 1680s. The year is, it was first published in 1682 in an unauthorized version, probably drafted earlier than that, 1676, 1678. It's a little bit unclear when it was drafted. Um, the edition that we're reading was published in 1684, which was the authorized edition. So somebody had been circulating it earlier and kind of trying to get it out there. Pope was not born until 1688. So we can't really say that he and Dryden are contemporaries at all. Um, because they weren't, <laughs> at least not in their professional lives. Um, but they have some similar themes in the poems that we're going to talk about this week, so I thought it would be fun to do them together. So McFleckno and Essay on Criticism, I'm pairing them together because they're both examples of critical poetry and of literary criticism that appears in various forms, particularly in the early part of the 18th century, but certainly continuing on through the entire century. And we'll read some more stuff from mid-century and a little bit later as the term progresses. Um, so I'm gonna give a little bit of background to each poem and then kind of talk about some general critical themes that they're engaging and that we'll see elsewhere in the literature as we progress through the rest of the stuff that we're gonna be reading over the next few weeks. So let's start with um, McFleckno because it is chronologically the first of the two poems that we're reading this week. As I said, it was first published in 1682 in an unauthorized form because it had been circulated earlier informally and somebody wanted to get it out there and, and take financial advantage. Now this is an, a good time to probably mention that pre-restoration, really before the English Civil Wars and back in the early modern period, literature was primarily circulated through um, a system where you know people would pass it on to their friends and it was mostly the upper class who were reading because they were the only ones who could read. Um, and so having something be published and then consumed by the general public is relatively new to the 18th century. Certainly at the time that Dryden is writing, it starts to pick up speed right around then. So by the time Pope is writing, one of the things that he's responding to in uh, Essay on Criticism and then on, in other poems later on is to this glut of literature that doesn't seem to have any kind of um, anything tempering it, that everybody wants to get in the game. And so there's a lot of bad quality stuff and he's kind of chafing against that because he's of course a really really good writer. So anyway, so Dryden's poem was published at some point in the early 1680s and you'll see that the subtitle of it is, um, no I just lost it in my notes. <laughs> the subtitle of it refers to Thomas Shadwell who is the subject of the poem. Thomas Shadwell was the poet laureate from 1689 to 1692, and he immediately followed Dryden, who was the poet laureate from 1668 to 1688. They started out as, if not friends, at least friendly. Dryden wrote the prologue to one of Shad Shadwell's plays, but then Dryden joined the court of Charles II, allied himself as a royalist, converted to Catholicism. Shadwell became aligned with the Protestants, aligned himself with Shaftesbury. And so all of the stuff that we were talking about last week with the um, attempt to overthrow the government and all the Absalom and Akitophel stuff that's still playing out here. There's still some allegiances and some problems that are, are spilling out because of that. So we think that the occasion for the poem was because in 1682, Dryden wrote a poem called The Medal, a satire about sedition, which was critical of a medal that was given to Shaftesbury when he was released from prison in 1681. And then Shadwell wrote um, a play called The Medal of John Bays, a satire against folly in knavery, knavery in 1682, which was a, an attack on Dryden. So the way that we know that this is an attack on Dryden is because there was a play that was written by somebody else 15 years earlier in which there was a character named John Bays who was the poet laureate and who is understood as loosely veiled to be um, Dryden. So when Shaftesbury called his play The Medal of John Bays, it, um, it was clearly attacking Dryden there. So then they kind of went back and forth a little bit on this. 
Um, and so Dryden's poem is a personal attack on Shadwell, and it's a pretty harsh one at that. Now, it's called the play, or the poem is called McFleckno, which means the son of Fleckno. And Fleckno is an English writer named Richard Fleckno. Not, I, I don't know why, <laughs> nobody really knows why Dryden is attacking Fleckno here. It's possible that he had just died and was a convenient target. It's, I, I don't know if he likes the sound of his name, whatever, but he chooses Fleckno as the, um, the king of dullness who is passing on his crown to Shadwell as the only legitimate heir to this throne of dullness that he's been on. And so we get in the poem, all of this coronation imagery. Of course, we have to be thinking of the exclusion crisis in all of this, the idea of who is going to be the next king that we saw in Absalom and Achitophel. And we see here that Dryden is using that plot device to talk about Shadwell inheriting the throne of bad writing. And we see all of those wonderful, funny references, you know, playing on the SH dash, which is how his name is depicted in the poem throughout the whole thing. And, you know, based on context, we can think about what that might mean as he's talking about all of the, the grime and the disgust and, and everything in England in this sort of fictional coronation procession. So the literary form that Dryden uses here in McFleckno is called the mock epic, which basically means that uh, a writer uses the elevated language, the elevated structure of an epic in order to talk about things that are not elevated, talk about things that are very base. So in talking about how awful of a writer Shadwell is um, and about inheriting this throne of being an awful writer and this throne of dullness and everything that Fleckno hands on to him, he's of course talking as if it were a formal coronation and a formal passing on of the throne from a king to a prince. Now, I've read some criticism that suggests that this is actually not a great form of the mock epic, and I would agree with that, because a, a good mock epic, which we'll see when we read The Rape of the Lock next week, really follows a dramatic plot through the whole thing in the traditional form of an epic that um, you might have, if you've read The Iliad or The Odyssey or even Paradise Lost or something like that, you'll know that it, there's a, an epic plot line that follows. There's really not a plot line here. It's Loosely, there's the coronation stuff kind of spliced in, but really it's a, a couple of long speeches talking about how awful Shadwell is, and that's it. So it's not, you know, the best version of the form, but that is what's going on there. Um, and McFleckno, the poem, uses the form of the heroic couplet. We'll also see that in essay and criticism, and it's typical of a great deal of poetry in this time period. So that simply means that the um, verses are written in iambic pentameter. They're written in couplets, couplets that have closed meaning. So they're closed off at the end of the two lines by a period, by a semicolon. So there's like a, a closed grammatical structure there within the couplet. And um, like I said, you know, that's very, very common in this time period. So well, I'm gonna switch over to Pope now, and then I'll talk about some of the um, literary concerns that both poems share. So Pope was born in 1688, like I said, years after McFleckno was written. So there's not a direct response here, but um, similar themes, which I'll get to in a second. When Pope was born, he had, he's had poor life, poor health his whole life. He had um, spinal tuberculosis. So he was born permanently disfigured. At his full adult height, he was only four feet, six inches. He had kind of a hump. He was, um, he, his critics, as he became a prominent person in English society, were just ruthless in uh, the way they criticized him, depicted him in cartoons, caricatures, called him an ape, a monkey, because he was all hunched over. Um, he was not, not treated well by the people who he did not like, or who did not like him, I should say. He was Catholic, so still, I know it seems odd to think about, but this is really a huge part of English culture at this time are these divisions between Protestant and Catholic in the relationship to the crown and what this means for who's in and who's out of society. So Pope's family was Catholic, which meant he was out, not only literally or figuratively, but also literally because at this time Catholics were not allowed to live within the city of London. So he had to live outside the walls of London. So he was separated in a few different ways. Um, he had, he got into the circle of literary friends from a very early age hung out with Joseph Addison, Richard Steele, 
lots of other writers that he became associated with. And he had very early and very quick and very big success. So the poem that we're reading, an essay on criticism, was written in 1711, and he was only 23 years old when that happened. Um, it was one of his earliest, really big, important uh, poems. Next came The Rape of the Lock. Then he did some major translations of Homer, some major editions of Shakespeare. In 1728, he wrote a poem called The Dunciad, which was a criticism of all of the bad writing that was out there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about The Rape of the Lock. 1733 was an essay on man, so a major philosophical survey of human nature and morals. And um, even then, you know, he was, what, 45 when writing that. So it's not like somebody who was 80 years old and reflecting back on the world. All of this happened when he was still relatively young. So an essay on criticism is a little bit different from McFleckno. McFleckno is just, it's basically mean. It's just an attack on one person. It's creative, it's fun, but it's, it's mean. Um, in an essay on criticism, though, Pope was trying to really spell out what some of these artistic and critical ideals are that a good artist, and more importantly for the context of this poem, a good critic should be following. So what are the things that a critic should be doing or not doing in the form of criticism? It's important because this is a form of criticism, essay on criticism, but it's also metacriticism because it's, it's critical of the critical act um, and giving some principles there. Now, both McFleckno and an essay on criticism are dealing with a few major literary and poetic ideals from the later part of the Restoration and the early part of the 18th century. One of them is nature. We see that coming up in McFleckno um, when the narrator talks about the nature of art that the character has been given. We see it in essay on criticism. In the early 18th century, when people say nature, what they're talking about is human nature. So they're talking about universal elements of the human experience, truths of human nature, things that have been, always will be true for nature. They're not necessarily talking about nature like trees and um, things like that. So this concept of nature was tied closely to the study of the ancients. Augustine writers um, who believed and studied and expressed in the essential truths of of life, the truth of human nature. So you'll see that pulled out as well. And in an essay on criticism, Pope does refer frequently to classical, meaning ancient Roman writers, and using their ideals. The early part of the 18th century is sometimes called the Augustan Age because these principles of um, structure and rational thought and everything that was big in the Enlightenment um, comes out in the poetry in this time period. and. The ideal, the Roman ideal, is big. And we actually saw that a little bit in Orinoco with the way that Orinoco is described as having like a Roman nose and that kind of stuff. So the next element that I want to talk about is wit. Wit in the 18th century is a highly valued skill. Um, it can be a noun, somebody is a wit. It can be, well, I suppose it's a noun either way. It's the, the act of having intellectual quickness, but it can also be the person who has the intellectual qu quickness is what I'm trying to say. So lively thought, creativity, the ability to see connections between things. Um, it's connected highly with fancy and imagination, so sometimes you'll see poets write about having the need to rein it in through judgment and reason. It can be a corollary there. Um, it, it's used in a lot of different ways, so you kind of have to pay to the attention to the context when the word is used, but it is generally, genuinely valued and generally valued. In an essay on criticism, Pope says, for example, the winged courser, like a generous horse, shows most true metal when you check its course. So the winged courser being wit, this idea of big creative imagination sometimes needs to be checked a little bit with reason. So pay attention to the places where both Dryden and Pope are appealing to wit. And actually in McFleckno, the opposite of wit, we see this in other of Pope's poetry as well, would be dullness. So if you see um, Dryden talking about how Fleckno or Shadwell has dullness as the king of dullness, then that would be the opposite of having wit, and of course is not a good thing. Another thing that Pope is doing, specifically in an essay on criticism, and we see a little bit in response to McFleckno, is that Pope believes that writing and criticism should have the aim to improve the moral life of readers as well. It's not just talking about what is literature, but part of the purpose of literature is to have a social influence on society and make the world better essentially. 
So we know that Charles II, um, after the English Civil Wars, when everything was shut down by Cromwell and Charles II came back in, all of a sudden there was theater and there was life and there were parties and there were not, I, Charles II liked to party, <laughs> so maybe not the most moral, traditionally moral way of living life. And um, in the early 1700s, after that had been going on for a while, and then of course we had the Glorious Revolution, so there's new people um, who are kings and queens, that there was kind of a pushback to that. And so some of what Pope is talking about is a pushback against this licentious um, life that had been in the crown during the age of the restoration. We're seeing in Dryden, to go back to that, you do see some of the way that he's describing um, Flecknoe and Shadwell and the crude language and there's a bit of a party atmosphere just in the way he's talking about it. So you see a little bit of it there, but not as much as what Pope is later referring to. So I hope that this isn't too confusing that I've been kind of bouncing back and forth between the two. I'll try to sum up a little bit what I wanted you guys to get out of this. Um, so pay attention to elements of nature, wit, dullness. What does it talk about in terms of what can we understand about being a good writer? What is it that the writers are valuing? What is Pope valuing in being a good critic? And um, think about how this helps us understand a little bit more about what's going on in the literary marketplace if there's so much literature out there that there has to be some kind of pushback against what counts and what doesn't. Keeping in mind, of course, that Dryden is writing against Shadwell, who is a poet laureate, who has a monument in Poets Corner at Westminster Abbey, so he's no, no slouch. I mean, um, he's not the kind of hack writer that Pope is so much concerned about, but the kind of vitriolic response that Dryden is having to Shadwell kind of tells you that there's a competitive nature going on too about who is going to be considered one of the better writers um, in the Restoration and in the early part of the 18th century. So it's a very lively period in terms of what counts as literature and what doesn't and who's going to be well known and valued in that world and who isn't. Um, so. I don't know. I feel like this lecture was a little bit all over the place. <laughs> but there are notes up on Pantheon that I hope will kind of help rein it in and tell you where I was planning to go. And I hope that you enjoy reading the poetry this week and that we can have a good discussion on the discussion boards. So let me know if you have any questions and have a good week.